Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cisco's Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Guillermo Diaz, Jr. Welcome back, Cisco Live. Are you out there? Are you out there? All right, I thought the coronas got to you last night, but obviously I think you're ready for some action this, as we wind this down. So some people say this is one of their best weeks of the year, but I will tell you this is my favorite week of the year, and I'll tell you why. Because in Cisco, I am you. I'm your role. So when I got on the plane, I will tell you, when I stepped foot in San Francisco on that plane, I was so excited. The theme of this event is Imagine Intuitive. So when I got on the plane, I saw all my Cisco peeps. And I was talking to them, and we were talking about intent, intent-based, and I got a few different answers. But when I got here, and I stepped into the Hyatt, and I saw many of you as I was walking in the hall, I was, now I'm with my peeps. Now I'm with my peeps. And it wasn't just a handshake. For those of you that I've known for many years, it was a hug because guess what? We've built this human network. And the human network, I saw in action really cool last night, people dancing in the streets. You know, I'm not sure if your picture's on there, but you're right in front. I'm not sure who you're looking at, but it was somebody good. This is the human network. This is how we come together. This intent. So we learned about technology. We learned it from when Chuck started talking about the next act, the new network. David Geckler talking about intent-based networking. Scott Harrell, we learned more about that. When I started the week, intent-based, 10 people gave me 100 different answers. And now I think we're down to about 18 different answers. So we're getting closer. But this is why we're here, is to learn about the technology, but also how that technology changes people's lives. So what was your intent when you came here? What was your intent? Was it to learn more about the technology? Was it to learn more about what's going on in other people's organizations? What was your intent? So one of the cool things is we talk about technology, and I would just love to give the people behind the scenes, the people that make this all happen, and by the way, there's a group of unsung heroes, and I know there's some glitches here and there, but look at the impact of the technology, of that network and what it does. 1.2 million threats blocked. Almost 400,000 viewers, not just in this room, but outside. 20,000 concurrent users on this network. And there's a group, I, got, I was so proud to go back there. This is a group in the Network Operations Center. And this is a group of unsung heroes. And they just make this thing happen. And again, when there's issues, they respond. And so for the group that makes this event happen, and for that group of unsung heroes, I would please ask you to give me a great round of applause. So you see the technical side, the technology side, but what's also cool is we also broke some other records. We had some 
goals of 100%, 500 pie tops, and 10,000 clean the world hygiene kits. And we met our goal for pie tops, and we beat our goal for the hygiene kits. So not only are we using the technology to make sure that we're all learning, but we're using technology and we're using ourselves and giving back to those that may not have, and may not be in positions that we're in. So I want to thank you for not only being here, but also making sure that the impact that you bring also affects others. So I want to give you all a great round of applause. Now, if you think about those two things, the technology and the social impact that we're making, we had this global problem-solving challenge. And we asked social entrepreneurs to give us their best. And we came out with three winners. By the way, all three of these social entrepreneurs are winners of the Global Problem Solving Challenge. Now, we went on to another challenge and said, okay, of those three, they were, over, they were in the area where the pie tops were being built, and you all voted for, of those three, who, was, who won the extra Global Problem Solving Challenge. And we had video compression technology. We had an IoT-based monitoring system. We even had a device that monitors critically ill newborns. And so you all voted. I'm so inspired by these young entrepreneurs, but I want to, right here, I want to announce the winner of the Global Problem Solving Challenge and the winner of $25,000 to take back into investing in their business. And the winner of the Global Problem Solving Challenge is... <laughs> dot Learn. video compression technology so that people who live in low bandwidth areas can access online learning videos. So, so inspired, taking technology to use for social impact, to change people's lives. So now let's get into the heart of the discussion. We have two futurists that are going to talk to us about how we're taking technology to change people's lives, how we're taking technology to drive the future of business and the future of humanity, and what role does science play in, in doing that, and how can we prepare and how can we innovate to get there? So we're going to hear from two experts, Amy Webb, futurist and author and founder of Future Today Institute, and Dr. Michio Kaku, theoretical physicist and futurist. So let me start with Amy Webb. Amy Webb is a quantitative futurist She's a professor of strategic foresight at NYU Stern School and founder of Future Today Institute. Her research focuses on artificial intelligence, and she's advised three-star generals, White House leadership, and some of the CEOs of the largest companies in the world. In her most recent book, the signals are talking, 
why today's fringe is tomorrow's mainstream. It explains how to predict and manage technological change. So without further delay, I want to bring up Amy Webb. Hello, fellow nerds. How are you all? All right, so um, three quick things about me as I get started. I'm just, I've got some complicated technology running. Uh, I'm a quantitative futurist. That's a weird job title, but it's 2018, and we all have weird job titles. Um, there's a, I built a digital version of myself, so for those of you who are using Twitter, uh, you can back channel me. And um, I'll be, I guess the other version of me will be tweeting out uh, while I'm speaking. And the third thing is, I brought you all presents. Um, I open sourced all of my research and put everything in the public domain on a while back. And I have brought a ton of stuff for you, which I will be sharing at the end. So it's been a strange couple of months. Uh, you can now, as it turns out, Get stuff delivered right to your car. So Amazon will deliver things to your automobile. Everybody is obsessed with Bitcoin. How many miners are in the room? Yep, yep. How many people are like, shit, Bitcoin. <laughs> Network problems, right. Everybody's obsessed with Bitcoin. ICOs, initial coin offerings, are the new IPOs. Everybody's getting into it. So the chairman of Uber has announced recently that, that Uber is launching a crypto. Um, Kodak, which I know we all think of when we think of the future. <laughs> Kodak is launching a crypto. There's no bubble. There's no bubble. This isn't strange. Toothbrushes have artificial intelligence. This is a real thing. You can connect your face to a toothbrush and to your phone and move the toothbrush around your mouth and I guess uh, do a better job of brushing your teeth, which is wonderful. And not just toothbrushes, but toilets have AI. So this is a, new, a brand new Kohler, Kohler toilet seat. You can go into the bathroom. Uh, it's Alexa powered. <laughs> yeah. So you walk in and you, I guess, uh, chit chat while you're going. You get the sports scores. What am I? We're, none of us watch sports. Look who I'm talking to. You get the you get the scores for things. Right, right, right. You get headlines on Reddit. And then if you're my husband or like most of the men in the world, you conveniently tell the toilet seat to not put the toilet seat back down, which is awesome. And as we all know, robots are coming to take our jobs, right? all of our jobs. So, and that cuts across multiple different industries, whether you're in the building trades or you're a barista, you're a truck driver, we keep being told over and over and over again, robots are coming to take our jobs. And if you think that you are the only ones concerned about this, you would be wrong. All right. So these are a bunch of funny things that have happened, but I'm a quantitative futurist. I use data to model out the future, and somebody like me would look at these weird stories and see maybe if there are some patterns there that might tell us something about what's coming. Are there signposts about the future? In fact, are there signposts about the future of IT? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Let me break it down for you. If you were to look at Amazon delivering stuff to our cars, you could see that as a disruption to the existing network infrastructure model. This is probably going to mean that we have hyperlocal nodes and connections, uh, and it tells us a lot about how network traffic, uh, how network uh, traffic travels, and how it relates to specific places that we are in the physical world. You could look at cryptos, and I don't think that Bitcoin is going to be around forever. On the other hand, we do know that blockchains are going to be used for trust and verification 
verification. And with everybody so excited, we're going to need bandwidth and compute power, orders of magnitude more than anybody's thinking about today. And if we were to look at AI-powered toothbrushes and toilets, um, to me, I would see biological interfaces and AI. I would see a disruption to authentication and to ID systems. And in terms of all of those robots, we're talking about autonomous systems and collaborative robotics, which mean big changes to network infrastructure. It means a disruption to the workforce. And ultimately, it means a big change to how information is moving around the world. So if you were to connect all of these different stories, I could tell you a story about your futures. So connecting these dots, one of the things that we know is that computing is going to be done closer to the source of data, which means less latency but new architecture models. It means that you're going to have to start thinking about IoT uh, in the bathroom. Like You're going to hate the IoT given what we know is coming. And it also means that we could possibly be looking at something as weird as benevolent worms and be benevolent malware. And that in actuality, people might want their routers to be hacked into in a good way, because we could start monetizing downtime as long as there's customer consent. So there's all kinds of interesting and weird things on the horizon if you connect those dots. I can connect these dots using data uh, and modeling. But to be honest, my models aren't always perfect. So I'm going to sort of give you the big takeaway right now. We'll get that out of the way. And it's this. There's literally no way to predict the future. So I'm a futurist, and I can tell you that there's no, like math explains this, but there's no way to accurately predict the future. And that's because you cannot possibly have all of the information that you need at any one time to accurately predict outcomes. And that's because of people. Uh, we are capricious. <laughs> we don't self-report information correctly. You could look at all of humanity as just one big, ugly, multivariate, uh, multiple regression. So, so we are hard to predict. And science would tell us that if you want to know the future, what you actually have to do, and it's a paradox, you actually have to focus your attention right now in the present. You just have to do it in a slightly different way. And to do that, you apply a data-driven methodology in order to map plausible outcomes. So thinking like a futurist really means making connections. It has nothing to do with making predictions. So with that in mind, over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how to forecast the future of artificial intelligence and how to use a futurist's tools to make connections on your own. When it comes to AI, all of you know this, I think. We have a tremendous amount of misplaced optimism and fear, and that's making us do and say crazy things. AI, in fact, is not a tech trend. Uh, it's the third era of computing. So we have to start looking at the future with clearer eyes. So what I want to do is just highlight some emerging trends within AI, and then I will tell you where I think we're headed as a result. So the first uh, emerging tech trend that has to do with AI has to do with our voices. So digital assistants are becoming ubiquitous. So this, these are things like Cortana, Alexa, Google, Siri, poor Bixby. Does anybody actually use Bixby? Let me see your hand. We'll make fun of you later. <laughs> Literally two people in this entire room are using Bixby. Right, so we're not using Bixby. Um, so, so the models that I've built show that within the next 10 years, um, we will be Type, uh, we will not be typing as much as we are talking. And that's because we're moving towards conversational interfaces, or what I would call a non-visual UI. This actually has a fairly dramatic impact on your work. Because if you think about it, and again, according to my models, 50% of the interactions that you have with machines will be using your voice by the year 2021. And that starts to shift the paradigm for how our networks and our infrastructure are built and how they operate. The second trend that's worth your paying attention to are voice prints and synthetic voice generation. So we're talking to machines. And as it turns out, machines are able to recognize us in new and interesting ways. So all of us, just like our fingerprints, we have voice prints. And our voice prints divulge much more than just who we are, like by name, or the fact that we're speaking. They're able to detect things like whether or not we're healthy, how old we are, what our emotional state is. 
but also really interesting things if you meld that together with machine learning algorithms and, and other data, the size of the room that you're in when you're talking, what material the walls are made out of, how many people are in the room, where you're sitting relative to your TV or to other people. So there's a tremendous amount of information that's loaded in with your personal voice print. Now, if you combine voice prints with generative algorithms, you wind up with this. So there are lots of really interesting new startups that are experimenting with synthetic voice generation. So this is taking your voice print and turning it into spoken words. So this is one of them. Another one, called Lyrebird, will take any tweet uh, that somebody has tweeted, and if there's enough audio captured of that person, um, they can scrape that voice and turn every tweet into what sounds like a spoken conversation. So take a listen to this. Is it playing? Well, we may not be able to take a listen to it, but, but uh, take my word for it. It sounds a little janky, um, but it does sound just like Donald Trump speaking. So let's set that aside for a moment and talk about generative object and image algorithms. So did anybody see there was a meme going around towards the end of last year? People were face swapping Nick Cage into a bunch of movies. So this was pretty, I know that some of you saw this. So this is pretty funny. So here's a movie that some of you may, may have seen, right? So it's evil Superman, I think, at this point. And there's Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Which is pretty good if you consider the fact that this was not done using a giant Hollywood render farm. This was just some like dude and his friends sitting around you know, playing around with this technology. So how does this work? Well, it turns out if you have enough data, if you have enough videos and images of somebody, um, and you have the right machine learning algorithms and processors, you can swap anybody's face onto just about anything. In fact, somebody built something called Fake App, which allows you to literally do this using the phone in your pocket. So if you've got a corpus that's big enough, you've got enough faces, you can process it through this and swap anybody's face onto just about anything, like Nick Cage. Now, if you combine generative audio and video, you get this. Let's see if this audio works. In case anybody's wondering, this is me as a hamster. Good morning, everybody. This isn't weird at all. All right, so that's Snap, right? Um, but the reason that that works is because we now are carrying, we've got these incredible networks, and we have this incredibly Process, uh, amazing processing power that we've got with us at all times that allows us to face swap our, ourselves onto other people, animals onto us. But as we all know, technology sometimes you know, evolves in unexpected ways. So this is a generated video with sound um, that was scraped from an appearance that President Obama did on The View and regenerated as something that looks like an official meeting that never actually happened. So take a listen and, and watch. For other people, uh, us being uh, thoughtful about other people's traditions uh -huh. uh, is something that uh, Michelle and I try to teach our kids. Uh, you, know, you talked about what we talk about over the dinner table. A lot of what we talk about over the dinner table is, you know, so that's pretty remarkable, right? I can't play you the audio to this or show you anything else. This is Daisy Ridley, star of, star, feminist icon for the younger generation, star of the new Star Wars franchise. And that's a porn that you're watching. So somebody swapped her face into, and Emma Watson and a bunch of other people into a bunch of pornos. So it's interesting that we have this technology, but technology evolves in ways that we don't always think through. Now here's the deal. Nobody hacked any routers or network infrastructure. This was not IT's fault, right? Yeah, it's always your fault. This one, not your fault. As it turns out, it was nobody's fault, legally, because nobody broke the law in the United States when they did this. Nobody technically broke any of the terms of service of any of the websites where these videos appeared. Doesn't meet the legal standard in the United States for revenge porn. Doesn't meet the legal standard for copyright infringement. And this leads, or it led me to the time, at the time to some thorny questions regarding our future and AI, which are these. Who owns your face? 
At the moment, nobody knows. Who gets to use your face? What happens if your face get, gets hacked? How can you get your face back? So let's set aside that for a moment and connect a few other dots. The next set of trends has to do with consolidation uh, within the AI ecosystem. And this is kind of a big one. So these are the big nine companies that control the entire future of artificial intelligence. Six are in the United States, three of them are in China. Tencent, Baidu, and Alibaba, which are collectively known as the bat. And then Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, and IBM. It's these companies who are doing predominantly all of the work, even if they are partnered with the universities. They control our entire future. And these companies continually mine, refine, and productize our data. That's fine. That's what they're set up to do. And if you keep hearing that data is the new oil, that is because it's us, we humans, who are a valu valuable natural resource. And just by virtue of being alive in the year 2018, we are generating copious amounts of data all of the time. Network data is part of that data that we're generating. Device data is data that can be mined, refined, and productized. Now, the problem is that not everybody agrees on how all of this data should be used and how it should be mined and refined. So let's set aside that for just a moment and get to our last cluster of trends, and that has to do with what we're currently facing, and that is a splintered internet. We think of the information wanting to be free and the World Wide Web and the internet that is big and open to all, and as it turns out, that's not quite the case anymore. We think of China and Russia as having a closed network, a closed ecosystem. Well, what we are starting to see is a series of splintered internets or splinternets. Right now, people in democratic nations all around the world are starting to see different versions of the internet. And this is one of the unintended consequences of the GDPR, which is the sweeping privacy legislation that went into effect on May 25th throughout Europe. So in lots of different countries around Europe, if they were to try to get to one of our news sites in the United States, they saw these notices. This was not like an IPv4 versus an IPv6 problem. This wasn't a network problem. This was a, well, you know, we didn't really think things through problem. Uh, and so the flow of information has changed. There's pending court cases and regulation now all around the world that have to do with what the network architecture and infrastructure looks like, how people share their information, what data can be used in mind and in what ways. And if you think network infrastructure is hard now, things are gonna get really, really challenging as we go forward. In fact, it's plausible that network activity, not from just country to country, but from state to state, could wind up getting restricted and regulated. Which means that even here in the United States, we could be looking at a situation where only some states allow data to be collected and used, while other states uh, allow for more free flow. Some states could start collecting online sales tax, others don't, and essentially the networks and the internet and the internets are behaving differently depending on where geographically you're located. So I've just shown you a bunch of trends. Let's now make some connections. That's where we started this conversation. So let's make connection between all of these emerging trend nodes and see how this might play out. And to do that, I'm gonna show you scenarios for the year 2028. As a futurist and somebody who does all of my modeling based in data, I tend to, to look very long term, but I'm pragmatic and I want people to take action in the present. So that's why we're using a 10 year time horizon. So let me show you some scenarios for what your life could look like just a decade from now. So if I were to use an optimistic framing, Today, you start thinking like a future, futurist. You are inspired. You decide to get out of your comfort zone. You're gonna start tracking weak signals. You're gonna look at disparate stories and make con connections on your own. You're gonna start making some connections to understand how AI, data, and how the big nine are going to disrupt IT. And you wind up developing industry-leading strategy, all of you, uh, regardless of the position that you're in. That's the optimistic framing. 
the pragmatic framing, we can basically continue on doing what we're doing without a lot of big changes. The big nine winds up blindsiding everybody working in IT. New network infrastructure helps some people, but ultimately it just becomes a giant nightmare. IPv6 and IoT become like bad words. <laughs> These are things that you never want to hear anybody say, and it becomes even harder to build and to maintain secure networks. The catastrophic framing, all this misplaced optimism and fear about AI and automation leads to heavy-handed regulation. You wind up lost in the middle. We see widespread consolidation, bankruptcies, algorithmic hacking, civil unrest. Basically, things suck. And if I were to tell you which one of these I think has the most likelihood of coming true, you're laughing. Uh, so if I were to use a probabilistic model, I would say given what we know to be true today, that we have a 10% chance of the optimistic framing happening, and then sort of split 40-50 uh, uh, between pragmatic and catastrophic. So I recognize that this sounds bad. Uh, and in fact, it could be bad. On the other hand, I've already told you that I don't know exactly what the future is going to look like. Somebody has decided that the future is ahead of us. Let me go back. See, we don't know. That's what happens. Um, so the future hasn't happened yet. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, the future is up to you. I, I really do believe that. You are the ones who have the power to change things. And you can create your own preferred futures. Technology doesn't just hap have to happen at you. It's a, it's a you know, network where we're all able to talk to each other. So I'm going to empower you uh, to go and build your preferred futures today. And to do that, we've gotten to the, pre the presence segment of the, of the talk. I've created a digital folder for you. This is it. Uh, it's case sensitive, and it's a Dropbox folder. So some of your organizations will let you hop on, some won't. There is a huge amount of stuff in here. So I've curated all of our tools that I want you to go back and, and start using. There's a folder. I think there's a Rick and Morty folder, because there should be. Because uh, everybody should know about the multiverse. Um, so there's a whole folder on AI content that I think is relatable and you'll find really interesting. Um, there's stuff about face prints. There's stuff about generative algorithms. And, and uh, there's a ton of information in here. I also created for you a how-to guide. The number one question that I get is, well, where am I supposed to go to look for these weak signals and, and what do I do? So this is a step-by-step, step, I think it's like six pages long, guide that explains how to get started. Um, and then uh, there's some tools that I mentioned, um, and I also dropped a copy of our most recent annual report. There's 256 trends this year that are worth your paying attention to. They're listed by industry, but really you should try to connect the dots on your own, so look across all of them. I believe that everybody can start thinking like a futurist. You don't have to have a background in math or the hard science sciences. This is something that you can do. You can start connecting the dots, and you can think like a futurist, and I need you to start, given what we know is coming, I need you to start doing it today. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So catastrophic, 50%. But you know what? I love her because it's not IT's fault. <laughs> so now let's, look, let's take a look at our second futurist. It's a theoretical physicist, futurist, and author. Four New York Times bestsellers, including The Future of Humanity. Now, Dr. Kaku, I asked him, what do you like to do for fun? And his response blew me away. He says, I, my fun is to finish off Einstein's work. His dream is to finish off Einstein's theory of everything. And when you see him, you'll know what I mean. You've seen him on Science Discovery and other channels talking about the future. Now, 
He blows me away in terms of social presence because he has three million Facebook followers and 650,000 Twitter followers. Now, if you think about Amy's view, and you think about the theoretical view that we're gonna hear, I've always wanted to do this, okay? Just humble me for a second. These things come down, and it almost hit me when I walked out. But if this thing dropped down, and you think about those two points of view, I've always wanted to do this, and I own the mic right now. So let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Doctor. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First of all, let me say that after my talk, I will be signing books. And after I sign your book, you can go to eBay and auction it off for money. <laughs> That's right, you can actually make money after my talk. Now, as was mentioned, I've written four New York Times bestsellers. The latest one is about the future of the space program. And I've had the privilege of interviewing over 300 of the world's top scientists who are inventing the future in their laboratories. Each time I interview them, I ask them the key question, the question of all questions, the question that has haunted philosophers and theologians for generations. I ask them that question, is there intelligent life? on the earth. <laughs> well, I was watching the Kardashians on TV last night, <laughs> and I'm convinced there's no intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> and when I talk about the future, I interview the people who are making it. I've been in the laboratories of people who are now connecting the mind to the internet. We are now witnessing the birth of the next generation of the internet, BrainNet, when we send emotions, feelings, sensations on the internet. And I'll show this in today's slideshow. But let me say, first of all, that we physicists are the ones who try to invent the future. In the 1800s, we worked out the laws of thermodynamics. Heat, that made possible the steam engine. That made possible the first great revolution in human history, the Industrial Revolution. And then, 80 years after that, we physicists invented electricity and harnessed the power of magnetism. That gave us dynamos, generators, television, the electric revolution. And then we worked out the theory of transistors, the quantum theory, and lasers. We are the ones who wrote the World Wide Web. Not only did we create the transistor, we physicists also invented television. We invented radio, radar, x-rays, microwaves, the space program. We invented most of the 20th century's breakthroughs. And whenever we physicists make a breakthrough, we try to make a prediction. When we wrote the World Wide Web, one physicist predicted that the World Wide Web would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. <laughs> Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet could be pornography. <laughs> So if the first wave of wealth generation was the industrial revolution and steam power, the second revolution was electricity, the third revolution was high tech, then what is the fourth wave of wealth generation? I say the fourth wave of wealth generation 
is a combination of artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and biotechnology. We're talking about science at the molecular level. That's going to drive wealth generation into the future. So, for example, if you are a doctor, you know that the internet is already in your glasses. You can see people's x-ray charts, people's history. In the future, the internet will talk back to you. Doctors will access RoboDoc. RoboDoc is artificially intelligent, accesses the entire internet, and gives you sound medical advice. Let's say you're in a car accident in a small country, a village in Europe. You don't speak the language. You don't know the local customs. What do you do? You talk to your wristwatch, and you talk to robo-lawyer. So we're talking about intelligent systems that you can talk to that access medical data, legal data, and they talk back to you. And when you talk to somebody, you will see a translation of what they say from Chinese into English. And you will see a biography of who they are as you talk to them. This is very important because tonight, tonight if you're at a cocktail party and you know there's some very important people at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are, in the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> so if you are a designer, you'll be able to conjure up images and have it printed out. We can now extract images from the living brain. If you think of something, we can actually print it out now and on a laser printer, print out a 3D model. So if you're a scientist, an artist, an architect, or a game player, this is gonna change everything. However, let's say you don't like to wear goggles. Then what are you gonna do? In the future, you will blink and you will be online. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> Yes, college students will see the answers to my exam right there by blinking. This means that we professors are gonna have to change the way we teach. No longer can we stress memorization, the periodic chart, amino acids. No longer can we stress that. We're gonna have to stress concepts, principles, and become mentors because we're gonna to have to interact with students, career guidance, grading homework assignments, rather than memorization, which you can get by simply blinking and accessing the world's internet. And this is how we will celebrate Christmas. At Christmas time, instead of battling the hordes, we'll simply go and download the blueprint of the toy and print it out. And so we're talking about mass customization. Those shoes right there, those shoes were printed at a shoe store. We can now print on cloth, and so your shoes can be printed right on the spot. Jewelry can now be printed out because we can now manipulate liquid metals. And so you can design your own jewelry. This is causing a problem for the toy industry, by the way. We have a new contradiction in terms as toys become intelligent. That contradiction in terms is smart Barbie dolls. <laughs> Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. <laughs> and this is the future of your cell phone. You will extract paper, intelligent paper, as much as you want, fold it up, and put it right back into your cell phone. In fact, we can make yards of intelligent paper. This is the future of your wallpaper. Today, if your wallpaper is old, discolored, torn, what do you do? You suffer, that's what you do. 
in the future, you simply talk to your wallpaper and have your wallpaper change design. And let's say it's four o'clock in the morning. You have a pain in your chest. Is it a heart attack? Or is it a pizza you had last night? You'll go to the wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to talk to RoboDoc. Boom. RoboDoc appears, accessing the entire internet, giving you sound medical advice. Now, let me tell you the good news and the bad news. The good news is this will benefit society. Things will be cheaper. Things will be more convenient. Think about it. Infinite information by simply blinking. You'll be able to talk to anyone in any language as you get things translated. You'll always know who you're talking to. On a blind date, for example, if your date says that he's single, rich, and available, your contact lens say that no, he has five kids, divorce payments, child support payments. Very handy. So that's the good news. What's the bad news? The bad news, and it's pretty bad, the bad news is that in the future, we will have lawyers. <laughs> yes, only a lawyer, a human, can talk to a jury. Only a human can talk to a judge. Only a human understands changing moral standards. That's why we're get, there's limitations to what robots can do, because we forget. Robots are adding machines. They add many times faster than you're giving you the illusion they're thinking. They're not thinking at all. They're adding machines. That's why I'll talk about the limitations in a minute, but among them is human interaction, mentoring, guidance, giving legal advice. None of that can be done by a robot. And one by one, industries are being digitized, including transportation. The first industry to be digitized was music. Remember? The music industry resisted that and said, quote, people will always buy music the old-fashioned way. Wrong. Guess who controls the music industry today? Take a guess. Who controls the music industry today? It's Apple computers and the computer industry through iTunes and things like that. What's the lesson here? The lesson is that you are free to ignore everything I've told you so far. You are also free to go bankrupt. So transportation is being digitized now, and this means no need for parking. In the future, you'll simply talk to your car, and the car will park itself. In fact, I predict that the robotics industry will become bigger than the automobile industry. How do I know that? Because in the future, your car will become a robot. You'll talk to your car. You'll argue with your car. The car will tell you, feed me, give me gas, repair this, repair that. The car industry is going to be absorbed into the robotics industry. And so the future will be seamless. Information when you need it, information that is usable, seamless transition. The next industry to be digitized is transportation. Yes, we will have flying cars. In fact, I was just in Dubai a few months ago. Dubai and Uber are now negotiating the first fleet of flying cars. And after that, we're going to have supersonic transport planes because we have supercomputers that can model supersonic airflow. I was in Russia last month giving a talk, and it took me 10 hours, 10 hours to go to Moscow. In the future, it'll be two hours when we have supersonic jets that are commercial. And then beyond that, we're talking about going to Mars in the 2030s. Now, the first space program, the Apollo space program had a spin-off. That spin-off was the microchip. Why did we create the microchip? Among other reasons, the space program needed to miniaturize computers. This new space program could give us a new generation of quantum computers, a new generation of computers because we have to miniaturize computer power even more. 
Now, I'm on radio. People sometimes call me on radio and say, Professor, that's all wrong. The microchip came from aliens. We captured a flying saucer and we reverse engineered the microchip. Well, how do they know that? I ask, how do you know that? And they say, I know that because I've been abducted. I've been kidnapped by flying saucer people. Well, I have some advice for you. The next time you're kidnapped by a flying saucer, for God's sake, steal something. <laughs> I don't care what it is. An alien ship, an alien hammer, an alien paper clip, anything. Remember, there's no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial civilization. No law whatsoever. Now, I'm building up to something. What am I building up to? I'm building up to, building up to the fact that even capitalism itself is making a shift to perfect capitalism. Capitalism re requires supply and demand, but it's imperfect. Why does the computer revolution speed things up? It eliminates the middleman, the friction, the aggravation. It makes perfect capitalism. Why is Amazon so great? Why is Jeff Bezos the richest man in the world? Because he digitized all the inefficiencies in the retail industry. So we're headed for perfect capitalism. And that means that there are winners and losers. For example, stockbrokers are middlemen. When you go to a stockbroker and do you go to buy stock? No. Stockbrokers no longer sell stock. At this point, you may say to yourself, that's stupid. Everybody knows stockbrokers sell stock. What else can they do? No. You can buy stock on your wristwatch. Why do you go to a stockbroker? Because you want something that robots cannot provide. You want intellectual capital. You want experience, know-how, savvy, innovation, talent, insight. That's why you're paying to see a stockbroker. And that's the future of the economy. The economy will more and more depend on intellectual capital, creativity, experience, leadership, know-how, analysis, none of which can be done by robots at the present time. So they're winners and losers. The losers are people involved in repetitive capital. Those, are, for example, automobile workers, things that are repetitive. The winners are semi-skilled workers like garbage men, every garbage is different. Plumbers, every toilet is different. Policemen, every crime is different. They cannot be replaced. But jobs involving intellectual capital, human relations, common sense, they are the jobs of the future. So I'm slowly running out of time, so let me just say a few things about the next industry to be digitized, and that is medicine. We can now put this chip inside your stomach. You swallow it. It has a camera. It photographs the inside of your stomach and sends beautiful information to a computer. This is because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most. Middle-aged men fear the C word, colonoscopy. That's when they stick that tube up your rear. But this in your stomach gives new meaning for the expression intel inside. Yes, Intel will be inside. And the next big thing is in your toilet. The toilet of the future will have liquid biopsies. We can now have a chip, a chip that ass assesses your bodily fluids and detects cancer colonies, cancer enzymes, cancer cells 10 years before a tumor forms. This is revolutionary. Ladies and gentlemen, in the future, the word tumor will disappear from the English language. This is amazing. We can now actually use computer power to analyze cancer colonies 
In fact, this is an ear. We can now digitize the human body. We can now create an ear out of plastic, seed it with cells, and an ear grows out of your own cells. This is a bladder that can now be grown because we've digitized the bladder. The next organ to be digitized is the liver. So tonight, you can drink up for all you alcoholics in the audience, <laughs> knowing that we are in the process of digitizing the human liver. And this is stem cells that we use for, uh, for our knee joints. The brain is the next organ to be digitized. As I said before, brain net is the future of the internet. By the way, we can also analyze brain blood flow and show that certain old wives' tales are true. It's an old wives' tale that many people believe that when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. <laughs> Absolutely true. We have brain scanned men talking to pretty girls and blood drains from the prefrontal cortex <laughs> and they start to act mentally retarded. Absolutely true. Now, let me end on the final note. When I was a child, I had a role model. My role model was Albert Einstein. And let me tell you my favorite Einstein story and I'll close. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache, I will put on a wig, I will be the great Einstein, and you can take a rest and be my chauffeur. So Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question, and Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can, we, have, uh, can we have Amy Webb come back on stage as well? Amy Webb. Oh, there she is. So, um, so it was great hearing from both of you. Now, what I would ask, you kind of heard each other. Is there something that you would say, maybe you start with you, Amy, that is in common with your point of view and the doctor's point of view? Um, what's one thing in common? I think we're both thinking a lot about the Internet of Brains and brain nets and um, the plausibility of transferring information and uh, skills and abilities um, and the promise of AI and health. I may be a little bit more on the dystopian side of that and see some problems, but I think that's one thing we share in common. How about, how about you, doctor? Well, let me ask you a question about the far future, okay? A hundred years, 200 years in the future. Are the robots gonna take over? The science fiction Hollywood movies like The Terminator, is that our future or are we gonna rule supreme? What are your thoughts? I have my own thoughts on the question. Well, that's a really good question because we tend to anthropomorphize artificial intelligence when we think about it, and robots are really just the containers for AI. So for us to conceptualize a far future in which robots that most of us think of, you know, our references come from the Jetsons, you know, come from many years ago, I think it's implausible that we'll be surrounded by our current ideas of walking, talking robots. But what do you think? Well, robots today have the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach. A lobotomized, retarded cockroach. A cockroach, but, then that would be a cockroach that's talking to a beautiful cockroach. <laughs> right. <laughs> but in a hundred years, I can see robots becoming as smart as us. At that point, I think we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. But then beyond that, beyond a hundred years, if I have a crystal ball, 
I would say that in the 22nd century, we should think about merging with them. So you think merging that's 100 year, 200 years off? Rather than fighting off the robots, why not become supermen and superwomen? Why not enhance our abilities by merging with our creations? That's already because happening. So Professor um, Miguel Nicolay yeah. at Duke has already started to, to do that. I think that might be even closer than we think. Right. And so I think that instead of fighting off the robots, inevitably they're going to get very intelligent in 100 years' time, not anytime soon. But at that point, we should think about becoming perfect, that is, becoming superhuman. I mean, why not live a life as Superman or Superwoman? What's there not to love? <laughs> well, I think the time frame, from my vantage point, I think the time frame is, is closer, but I think that's more concerning because what's probably going to happen is that rather than um, chasing after perfection uh, to live a better life, we'll probably be chasing after optimization mm -hmm. to live a more competitive uh, collective life. So, you know, I could pretty easily see governments connecting people to each other, to machinery for the purpose of, of dominating uh, discussions and creating combat situations that we can't even think of today. Yeah. Well, we have this debate between Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Elon Musk of SpaceX. I think to some degree both are correct in the short term and long term. Zuckerberg, I think, is right in the short term. For many decades to come, artificial intelligence will give us jobs, prosperity, progress, alleviate human suffering for the short term. That is maybe 100 years. But after that, let's not be naive. After that, robots could become self-aware. See, monkeys, for example, are self-aware. When robots become as smart as monkeys, we have to be careful because monkeys know they are not human. Now, dogs, on the other hand, dogs are confused. Dogs think that we're the top dog. We're the top dog, they're the underdog. And so that's why dogs follow us. But when robots become as smart as monkeys, they're self-aware. At that point, I think we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off <laughs> if they have murderous thoughts. How about if we still have the ability. I, I'll just say that I think the, using the term artificial intelligence, which got invented, it was a term of art in the 1950s at a meeting that happened between a bunch of all men, professors at Dartmouth. Um, I think it's a misnomer because we assume that we're creating technology and as creators that technology will always behave as we humans behave. But intentionally, the way that AI and the frameworks work is, is diverges from us. So um, artificial intelligence is probably not right. Alien intelligence is probably much more correct. And that ought to change how we're thinking about humanistic robots, uh, this, again, this misplaced optimism and fear, and we need to have clearer eyes going forward as we think about the future, near and far term. I will now let you go. Okay. But thank you. For be any, any, any one last sort of quick hit for the audience for the future. Yeah, I mean, it really is, you can't let technology, we're at a tech conference, you're all technologists. Don't let technology happen to you or at you. You gotta plug yourselves in. And I really do think that just as the machines are starting to wake up, we're all closing our eyes and drifting off to sleep, and that's a mistake. So hopefully you leave here a little bit more aware as the machines are themselves potentially on a track to becoming aware. Doctor. Yes, every revolution has winners and losers. You are among the winners. Congratulations. You were at the <laughs> forefront of intellectual capital. You were at the forefront of innovation, of creativity, of analysis, of leadership. That's intellectual capital that cannot be duplicated by robots. And so you are at the cutting edge. So congratulations. You are among the winners. Congratulations. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. <laughs> but now I get it, okay? Now I get it. So my wife is very beautiful, okay? And now I know when I talk to her how she looks at me like, 
did you really ask me that question? <laughs> so imagine the, f imagine the future. Imagine intuitive. That's what we started with in the week. And when I came here, and hopefully like you came here, you had an intent. And for me, that intent was to make sure that I understood better intent-based. And I do after this week. And I understand it from a technical standpoint, a technology standpoint. I understand it from hearing David Geckler, from hearing Scott Harrell, and all of the, all of the expertise across this great event. But I also connected, and my intent, and hopefully your intent, was to learn from others. You know, the culture that we've built here, and I just, I, I can't tell you enough the energy that I felt this year that as we make this transition, as we make this transition to the new network, the network of the future, and how we as leaders, we need to put those things together, the technology and the humanitarian side. We heard that from what we, we just gave a, a big award here. And putting technology to use to change people's lives. And it's us as leaders, and you heard it from these two fine people. It's us as leaders. We have to leave here, go back to our teams, and go back as citizens in this great world to really put those together. And what we've also heard is that we're all now developers. We heard that from Susie Wee. So I think, and hopefully you think the same, I've accomplished my intent for the week. Technology, meeting with all of you, the culture, the leadership, and learning that I'm a developer. And the network's next act. What I would ask you is to think about your intent. Think about your intent for the next year. Think about how intent-based networking is going to change your business, but also think about the intent that you're going to drive. And next year, I challenge you that we all get together and we share what our next act is going to be. What is your next act? And I want to know that next year when I see you all in San Diego, California. So thank you for being at Cisco Live. Thank you for being here. of humor, a great combination of relatability. They made us see the future of technology, but through human eyes, which is what we try to do here at Cisco. And on that note, we got a quick interview with them, so let's throw it over to Steve. Thank you so 
much. Really appreciate the toss in. And Professor Webb, I, I know you just came off the stage. It was a brilliant talk, and we really appreciate you taking a couple of moments. Uh, did you have fun out there? I guess is the first logical question. I did. These are my people. These are, people. Uh, these are, these are my fellow nerds. I don't so, know that yeah. any, have ever seen anybody else come out on our stage and say, hi, welcome, fellow nerds, and everybody just erupted. <laughs> you, knew, you, you had them in your hand right yeah, off the bat. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was saying a moment ago as we were talking outside that I took a whole list of notes, and the main thing that I kept coming back to is, is there a tipping point eventually for AI? You talked about toilets, you talked about toothbrushes, these things that are in our everyday lives. Do we get to a point where we have gone too far, or do we not get to control that? Well, well, we AI is already here, so a lot of people think of it as this futuristic concept, but it's been in some form of development for 400 years. It got its name in the 1950s, and the thing with AI is that every single time it that that automation becomes sort of secondary or commonplace, we no longer think of it as artificial intelligence. So, you know, we're, we're all surrounded by artificially narrow intelligent tasks and applications all day long. Now, the stuff with toothbrushes and toilets, which are a little more gimmicky and interesting, do signal a future in which more of our daily decisions are going to become automated and we will be interacting using more of our own biology. So, so that is a change, but we're in a 70-year transition transition. So there's no on and off switch for AI. We're in it. We're in the middle of it, and it'll keep transitioning over the next seven decades. Absolutely. How far? How much does ego play into this? We like to think that we are the ones who came up with these genius ideas, that we are pushing the future so much. Is this an inevitability when you get right down to it? Well, ego is part and parcel of the development of AI because it is, you know, the, the, the point of AI is to create thinking machines, and those thoughts were generated originally, um, you know, by early computer programmers and neuro scientists and you know cognitive you know, people who think about cognitive processes so our minds are very much in the machines and it is you know to some extent ego that drives this process forward but i would say that that's probably true of any innovation or technological development otherwise how do we advance that's right? right if we don't have our own brains up there saying hey we're wonderful we come up with the best ideas in the world how else do we advance anything whether it's a society a concept a technology right now i would say that in america we're very we are nowists we don't think about the future <laughs> uh, compared to other countries and and we you know ai at the moment serves two masters one is in silicon valley and the other is in Washington, D.C., which sort of only pays attention when something goes wrong. That is a, at a stark contrast to what's happening in China, where some of the most important developments in deep learning and machine learning and uh, edge computing and all of the different pieces that go into AI are, are currently being developed. There is a radically different model in China that is very, very coordinated at a strategic, you know, high strategic level within the government. Um, so to that extent, I would say that it's nationalism that's you know driving AI in China and probably more ego and, and capitalism that's driving it in the US. Interesting, do you have uh, do you have a horse in that particular race? <laughs> I'll just ask you personally. Yeah, uh, the US is really far behind. People here don't recognize or acknowledge the incredible work that China is doing. Um, and you know that could cause us some problems in the future given that the technology sometimes evolves in ways that we don't expect or anticipate. Um, and ultimately, you know, the, the developmental track of AI is sort of dictated by the people who are working on it. And the goals of Silicon Valley don't necessarily always align with democracy. And we certainly know that the goals of China, the China's government don't necessarily align with our own. So this is something we all ought to be thinking about now. You have such a unique perspective because you have multiple feet in each of these sandboxes. I have so too many to feet. Hear your perspective. Yep. Too many feet. Too many feet. <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the extra time here. It was a phenomenal talk. And uh, I hope you've had a good time with us thank here at Cisco so today. I absolutely have. It's a great conference. Oh, that's great. Mandy, we're going to toss it back out to you. Sounds good. I'm standing here with Kelly. You just saw the keynote. What did you think? It was fantastic, actually. The, the most impressive part to me was when the doctor talked about a pill you could swallow to detect colon cancer. My father is actually a survivor of colon cancer and, uh, and so that really impacted me. I was like, wow, if he could have been detected years and years ago, then he wouldn't have had to gone through everything he has gone through to survive. And as as me as his child, I'm I'm more prone to that and being and uh, so I'm gonna have to be taking those tests, you know, over the years. And so I, I, it would be fantastic if I could just take a pill and have that detected. Uh, and and he talked about that it just you could detect any type of cancer and there would be no more tumors and that would be 
awesome. I can't even imagine such a future. It is incredible, and I think it's going to happen. I'm just going to keep thinking that. And thank you so much, Kelly. We really appreciate it. Back to you, Steve. Thank you so much, Mandy. I appreciate it. So we're back here with Dr. Kaku now. And as I just said to him a moment ago, we're going to take just a couple of seconds to increase the value of those signed books on eBay even further, if that's okay by you. That's right. When's their autograph? is like gold. It really is like gold. I'm buying one. You know that's the case. Uh, so many phenomenal things that I heard during your talk, and brilliant job, by the way. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, we talked about, you talked about uh, microchip coming out of the Apollo program, and one of the things I thought is, all right, is there a next microchip? Could we potentially go the other direction? We need to create the macro chip, the maxi chip. Is it going to push one direction or another? What do you see? Well, we're used to Moore's law that every Christmas time, our chips are twice as powerful as the previous Christmas. That cannot last forever. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. You could have mass unemployment in the computer industry because silicon only goes so far. You cannot make a transistor out of an atom of silicon. Transistors are so tiny. Now, we have to go to the next generation, which could be molecular transistors made out of carbon or quantum computers computing on individual atoms and that's where physics takes over we physicists are desperately trying to find a replacement for silicon and that's why i think as we go back into outer space just like the apollo space program energized the search for the microchip going to mars may stimulate a new generation of computers based on molecules and atoms that's the future of computation not silicon. Absolutely fascinating. Tell me about robotics. Uh, I want to go back into that because that was about to halfway through your talk. You were talking about things being roboticized. You talked about the car as being the next logical step. What do you think are the next daily things in our lives that we can look forward to being roboticized? Well, the first industry was music, mm -hmm. and now iTunes controls the music industry. <laughs> now it's media being digitized, newspapers and television being digitized. Next is going to be transportation with driverless cars, flying cars, supersonic jet transports as transportation is being digitized, and beyond that, the human body. We're going to digitize our organs. We're going to digitize parts of the human brain. So one by one, all of society was going to be digitized, making life cheaper, more efficient, seamless, no more aggravations, information at your fingertips. Like, for example, the internet will be in your contact lens. You'll blink, and I'll see who you are. You speak to me in Chinese. My my contact lens will translate Chinese into English and we'll be able to break down human barriers. Fascinating and terrifying in, in, in simultaneous level. And by the way, uh, thank you for digitizing the liver because I think that is where we're headed next, which leads to another question I wanted to ask you, which is, where is the morality curve on this? And you touched on it a little bit in your talk that we are always pressing up against that moral boundary where is there such a thing as too far or is it going to happen regardless of our moral impetus on that thought? Believe it or not, I disagree with most scientists on the question of the moral direction of technology. Most scientists would say that technology is amoral, like a hammer. A hammer has no, is not good or bad. I disagree. I think the spreading of the internet increases the empowerment of the little guy which means that democracy is empowered and nations, uh, the democratic nations do not war with other democratic nations. List every single war you had to memorize since you were in grade school, every single war. They've always been between kings, queens, emperors, dictators, never between two major democracies. So I think the internet revolution has a moral direction. It's creating a world that is more democratic, fewer dictatorships, people are empowered. And so I think that, yes, there's a moral direction to technology. Very, it's it's a combination of inspiring and terrifying at the same, <laughs> at the same but time. But it'll be done democratically. It, it'll be done democratically. When you come up in front of an audience like the one that you have here at Cisco Live, so now you've got a room full of engineers, a room full of visionaries, a room full of thought leaders. My people. Your people. Do you change your talk? in a certain way knowing who you've got sitting out in front of you in the house? Well, yes, to a degree, because I don't have to go back to the very beginning and explain what computation is all about and so on and so forth. These people are at the cutting edge. In fact, I say that every revolution has winners and losers. These people are the winners. Because what are the jobs of the future going to be like? The jobs of the future are jobs that robots cannot do. It's as simple as that. 
So what can't robots do? <laughs> robots are not creative. Uh, they don't have common sense. Pattern recognition is very bad, and they certainly don't have human relations like talking to a judge or talking to a jury. And so you can literally on your hand count the jobs that are going to flourish once you understand that. If you don't understand that, it's all Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator robot going to kill us all. And it's simply fear alone. Right. But if you understand that robots do not have common sense, they do not have understanding of human behavior, they do not, they're very bad at pattern recognition, then you realize that there's going to be a lot of jobs open. For example, police, because every crime is different. Garbage men will have jobs. Every piece of garbage is different. Carpenters will have jobs. Plumbers will have jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, no robot can fix a broken toilet, for example, right? Plenty of jobs out there. And of course, intellectual capital. And that's what this audience is all about. This audience is about intellectual capital, about creativity, innovation, analysis, leadership. That's what intellectual capital is all about. That's fantastic. And you heard that directly from Dr. Michio Kaku himself. So in case you're ever wondering why you're at an event like this or why you're involved in a community like this, there was your perfect explanation. Doctor, thank you so much. Truly appreciate the time. Mandy, we're going to toss it back out to you in the front. Wow. My that pleasure. was amazing. I mean, they're packing up here in the keynote. They're packing up chairs. And I think it's time we, we should go soon. Yeah, and Annie had to leave. Bye, Annie. Bye, Annie. She's leaving for her flight. See you later, But that's Annie. how it goes. All live TV. It's been crazy. Tomorrow. Uh, to, oh, sorry. Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so what has been your favorite part of Cisco Live, Reggie? Hands down has to be DevNet. DevNet inspired me. There's there's power in allowing our dev developers an open API to develop new pro programmability inside of our networks. And I'm excited to see where we go and what we achieve next year at Cisco Live 2019. Um, I'm going to take it in another direction. This is my first Cisco Live, my first time being with Cisco TV. I felt such great community with all the production staff, and I just want to say thank you to everyone for just being so awesome and really great with all these new hosts. Absolutely. Amazing. I totally agree. It's been amazing behind the scenes. The attendees have been awesome. Everything mm -hmm. about my first Cisco Live, your yep. first Cisco Live, you've been, you've had a few maybe? Nope. No, your first your one? Cisco first Cisco Live. Live. All of our, we're, yes. it's our first Cisco Live. Now, I have to take it back to Michio because the thing that excited me the most was the fact that, sure, there's AI, there's robotics, you know, and that's exciting, but there's always humans, right? Us folks, human beings, can will we'll do things that robots can never do, and that, that makes me really excited because... You know, my sci-fi brain gets crazy and I think, oh, robots are going to take over. Is that possible? Will it all be AI? But it, he just, you There's know. There's a robot coming here soon. Oh, my God. Cue the robot. <gasps> Cue the robot. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve, what was it like interviewing him? That was really incredible. First of all, you watch somebody like Dr. Kaku on CNN, or you'll watch him on MSNBC, or you'll see him again on Discovery or on Science Channel. These are the people who truly are creating the visions for the future. In a lot of ways, it's people like Dr. Kaku that create the vision that a lot of these engineers want to aspire to. That's why they end up creating what it is that they create. We hear from the visionaries. We hear from the futurists. They say, this is what we're headed toward. And either you get terrified by it mm -hmm. because I need to create something that goes in a different direction, or it's I want to be the one who builds that and I want to be connected to the design team. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. clearly you heard it from the audience. People were stoked. When he ended with, congratulations, you guys are the winners, everyone's like, yeah, yes. what a deal! Yes. yes, and to not be afraid of change, you know? And I love the Q&A because it was a duality of a futurist, right? You had the pragmatic one and then you had the hopeful one. And to see them go back and forth about it, it wasn't anything bad. It was just a very interesting perspective because that's how we are humans and beings. Yeah. It's so true. I thought it was a phenomenal closing keynote, and, and, and I want to kind of change it because we're headed into the very closing element of the show. This is one of the hardest things every year, and I know I say this each and every year, so I apologize to those of you who are actually bored by it. <laughs> one of the hardest things about this show I always find is saying goodbye to this show. We tick down to the end and we look at how much we've accomplished over the last four days, the nature of the conversations that we've had, the wonderful people we've interviewed, and a huge part of it, I've got to be honest, is the team that I get to play with every year, and this year, you guys batted it so far out of the park. I want to remind you that even though these are spectacularly intelligent human beings, it is the first time that they've had an opportunity to join us on the Cisco Live TV broadcast team. 
I thought you guys were brilliant. And it's just been fun to play with all of you throughout the week and kind of watch how things have gone, get to know you a little bit more than I already did before we got started. So I just wanted to congratulate each of you for a job truly, truly well done. Yes, congratulate. You. you guys were awesome. Yeah. You guys yeah. are absolutely amazing. And thank you, Steve, for totally like leading us through that. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much leadership I was able to provide, but it was loads of fun to do it yeah. regardless. Yeah, you were a player fun. coach this week. Yeah, yeah, Coach Steve. We have a bunch of people that I want to thank, and I'm just going to really quickly go down this list because I always have to put it on the phone or something else. I, I believe a couple of years ago, uh, one of us had a gigantic toilet paper roll. Am I remembering that correctly? I'm looking oh, out of my crew amazing. here. And that's what they read it off of. So I just want to, I'm going to do this really fast to our producers, Erica, Vicki, Simon, Rachel, uh, Kirsten, Amy, Luke, Thomas, Todd on the tech management side, Carissa, thank you for getting us where we needed to be to our microwave crews. And we're staring at them right now, these genius people. The cameras are not on them, them. But maybe we can swing it around. <laughs> um, our, our two you leaders, fearless leaders, Julie Arshup and uh, Pat Larson, and then Ed, Brian, Josh, Sam, Tony, thank you guys so much. On the camera side, back in the studio, Chris, Brian, and Kevin. On audio, my fabulous, divine AJ Riggs, who I adore so much, Andy, Eric, Kevin, our editors, Tosh, Evan, Oscar, Barb, John, okay, Danny, Mike, you, Megan, Brian, Bill, Andrew. There's, I know, at least a few people that we forgot on that, but uh, we couldn't do this without any of them. They've made us look great all week. We've had fun playing with them. I think Our that's the guys. most important part. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Jenna and Michelle. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I know. Yep. We almost forgot, but we didn't. Well, we didn't forget. No, you didn't forget. It always, see, it's a team effort, right? Yeah, effort. totally. That's why you're the player and the coach. I just support you. <laughs> All right, here's the very last thing we're going to do. I'm going to go down the line, and I want, I, I, you guys were talking about it a moment ago, about the one uh, maybe technology thing or highlight of the show. I want kind of a personal highlight of what you got out of the week. And Mandy, I want to start with you. What really kind of um, got your emotion going, got you particularly excited, not from technology, but from just being in the room with all these people? Oh my goodness. I mean, uh, I have to talk about the team that we worked with, you know, but backstage, it was just incredible. I had never done anything like this. So seeing the animal and how it works and all these different people and the give and take, and when they think that things are going crazy, I think they're so organized. It's like a beautiful machine and it blew my mind. I, I feel so honored to be a part of this. I had such a blast and uh, I, I, I'm so happy I met all of you. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. Stephanie? Um, as someone who works at Cisco, you know, it's really fantastic about conferences is like these. It's like you, you're walking down the walls and then someone comes up and like puts their arm around you. It's like, oh my gosh, it's Julie from Ohio who you only see over WebEx. And like you get that connection where you're all in this one place at this one time and you're just so happy to meet these friends that you don't really see in person. So that was really fantastic for me. Love it. Reg? For me, it has, I, I had an epiphany this week walking through seeing everything comes together, seeing our customers, our partners. When you're at Cisco, it's hard to see the impact that we have on the community, on the world, because you're trying to do your part to add to it. For you to come here and see everything happening, seeing Chuck, seeing actual products, actual customers talk about it, the global problem solvers actually using our products to change the world, it was kind of an epiphany of like, oh, so this is what Chuck is talking about when he comes on stage, yeah. or what Sherry's talking about, what Fran is talking about, Hilton, just down the list. Chaos and wonder. Chaos and wonder. It really does put it all into the room. There's nothing to bring it to reality like all of this conceptual separate siloed pieces and it comes together in this particular week. That's why when Guillermo Diaz hits the stage and he talks about uh, how personal it is to him and John used to talk about it and Chuck always says it's the favorite week of the year. You can't really explain that to people unless they feel it themselves but uh, you mentioned it right away on the first moment of the first day where you said wow you get in that room and it becomes overwhelming. Um, and again I was really overwhelmed by you guys and Annie as well. Annie Murphy couldn't be with us. She had to head off to catch a flight, but uh, our fifth member of our team, our clutch, who is not here in the room with us right now, but uh, she did an amazing job as well. So again, my thanks to all of you. Wait, wait, there's yes. one person we have to thank. Steve, Steve, you did an amazing job. We have to thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, my friends. Truly appreciate it. And thanks again, a special, special thanks to all of you. We do it every single year. We are so grateful that you guys have been watching us all the way throughout the week, spending this time with us and sharing the experience along with all of us. We are going to see you in San Diego next year, CLUS 2019 and right now we're going to show you a fabulous highlights reel that our fantastic edit and production team put together to put a cap on the whole week thanks so much again everybody see you next year bye, bye. 2019 <laughs>
get up every day and we think about networking. And we think about your networks. And we care deeply about making sure that you personally are successful, that your organization is successful, that you're able to actually create the environments that will enable all that's possible in the future. It's all about the networks of people. Who do we connect with? How do we create more power by being connected? If you ever want to really come face to face with understanding the value of what we do, there's this unbelievable despair and this incredible hope that is just inspirational to all of us and it makes us want to keep doing everything we do like this every single day.